whether it's we move into uh, or get closer to the arrival of our Lord at the end of all things, uh, there's simply going to continue to be a great falling away uh, from the gospel of the Lord. And there will be more and more people not telling the truth of the gospel. There will be more and more people waxing worse and hating the words of truth that are found in your Holy Bible, in my Holy Bible. Now, not everybody's walking around claiming to know Jesus or belong to the body of Christ. You have other faiths or other religions that simply um, have it seared in their mind that their religion is correct and right just as well as the believers of Christ do. And why is that? Well, of course, it's because God has ordained all things before the foundation of the world to be as they are. Put it this way, whatever will be, must be. There's nothing that's going to be done on this earth or that has already been done on this earth that did not have to happen. I don't care what you can name or what umbrella, how drastic, um, how terrible it is, how great it was, how awesome it was, how big or how small. It doesn't matter. Everything that has happened under the sun already and the things that are going to happen are already ordained of God. Well, how do I know that? Well, if you will, turn to Isaiah 46 and 10 with me, please. Isaiah 46 and 10. And let's see what the prophet Isaiah said concerning the things done by Jehovah God. Isaiah 46 and 10. And verse 9 starts off by saying, Remember the former things of old, for I am God. And there is none else, so there is no other God. I am God and there is none like me. So there is no God that is living like the Lord our God, Jehovah or Yah. Call him Yahshua, call him Jesus, call him Jesus. Call him Yahshua, it doesn't matter. Those titles equal just one God. Look at verse 10. The prophet declared in verse 10, this is what God does. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient or the older times the things that are not yet even done saying that my counsel shall stand and I shall do all my pleasure. So the prophet declared that from the very end, God declared the beginning. Or from the very beginning, God declared the end. And even the things that are not yet done, God has already declared them. Saying that my counsel or my instructions are going to stand forever. Or my purpose is going to stand forever. So whatever goes on from beginning to end, even the thing that has not yet been done, God has already declared it. So yes, I keep telling you that even the very drastic thing that brings tears and heartache and pain to the minds and hearts of mankind, God ordained it. He does not have human feelings. Now the Bible declares in many different places where it would give human attributes to the Lord God which many call anthropomorphism, where they try to equate, uh, make God relative to men or the, relative to the understanding of man by giving him human traits. But we know that God is not a man. But to better understand God, God has allowed his writers to give him uh, human qualities, so to say. But God has declared the end from the beginning. Now, all these religions that we have, and they say that 33% 30, of the world is uh, Christianity. And you have other portions uh, that make up the rest of the percentage uh, of these different religions around the world. But, that 33% that they say that represent Christianity is not true. Because in that 33% they have, uh, wrapped up in Christianity, they have uh, Catholics, uh, Mormons, uh, Latter-day Saints, 
They have a multitude of different faiths or religions wrapped up in what they call the umbrella of Christianity or Christianity. But that's not true. Only a few are going to be saved in the end time and only a few has God ever ordained to eternal life according to Acts 13, 48. Though out of this 33% that they say is under Christian, every one of them claim to love God and every one of them claim to be a part of God's family. But there's a big problem today amongst them and amongst all the other religions in the world. None of them have the same kind of cross that Jesus had and that Jesus gave to his disciples. None of them. Now, disciple, the word disciple is not uncommon amongst Christian. I mean, it's so embedded in our everyday vocabulary when it comes to Christian or biblical things uh, because Jesus came to save sinners and he came to train and teach men to be disciples. As a matter of fact, the word disciple is used around 262 times in the New Testament. Uh, you hardly find the word disciple used outside of the subject of Christendom or biblical uh, topics or biblical subjects. You hardly find the you. I'm not saying it is not, but you hardly find it used outside of Christian. Now, people don't want to pay the cost of a true disciple. Yes, salvation is free. And yes, you don't want to receive salvation from God. But you do pay a cost for being one of God's disciples. There's a price you have to pay for belonging to the family of God. Uh, one of the, the most uh, taxing cost there is to belong to the family of God or being a disciple is the fact that you have to give up your own self, your own desires. The thing that you mostly claim uh, cr uh, crave to do, nine times out of ten, we're so contrary towards, the, towards God that nine times out of ten is going to be Contrary to purity and holiness or what is required of the disciple of Jesus Christ. Now this word disciple comes from the word mathates. Mathates. It is number 3301 in your New Testament uh, part of your strong concordance. And what this word means is to be a literal learner. But when you look it up in the definition and uh, look up the definition in other from other sources ex, uh, outside of the Strong's, some lexicons and um, uh, Vine Strong's uh, uh, dictionary and other Greek dictionaries, you will find that it means to be intimate. With the teaching. It means to be intimate with the teaching. As a matter of fact, this word, uh, mathetes, it is opposite from the word didaskalos. Didaskalos, and I'll spell that for you also. Didaskalos means to be a teacher. It means to be a teacher. So what a mathetes is, it is a learner that is intimate with a teaching and it follows the teaching that it's intimate with. You remember over there in John 10, Jesus said that my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Follow me. This word follow comes from the word of kulo. Uh, 
Akulo. Akulo Theo. And what it means, what this word means to be, it means to be in the same way with. It means to be in the same way with the instructions or the teaching that you're intimately following. Now, Jesus described two ways in Matthew chapter 7. Two ways. He described a broad way where you find many traveling down that, that path. But that path leads only to destruction and death. But then there's a second way that he named, and that way is what is called the narrow way. Now, many people don't travel down this narrow way. It's only a few that travel down that narrow way. That narrow hodos, which means that narrow way or narrow journey. You only find a few. That few is going to be the elect that God has ordained to eternal life and predestinated to be conformed or shaped in the image or likeness of Jesus the Christ. Yahshua, the Lord God himself. So when Jesus said, and they follow me, speaking of his sheep, it means that they're being the same narrow way with him. They are intimate with the teaching. And they are a learner. They are for continually learning the teachings of their instructor, their didaskalos, which means their teacher. Jesus is our didaskalos. He came to teach us the instruction that he received from his father. He relays it to us and we follow it, we learn from it, and we come forth bearing fruit. As a matter of fact, in John 8, chapter the 31st verse, Jesus declared that if you continue in my teachings or my instructions, then are you my disciples indeed. Well, the word indeed is the word alathea. And it means of truth or simply put truth Jesus said if you continue in my teachings or continue in my instructions then are you my disciples or my learner or you're intimate with my teachings then are you my disciples in truth everybody is not a disciple indeed or in truth now, anybody can be a disciple of Jesus. Anybody. I'll explain that in a minute. But not everybody is his disciples indeed or his real disciples. Let me explain. Go to John the 6th chapter, please. John the 6th chapter. Go to John the 6th chapter. And we'll pick up probably about verse 56. Jesus said, As the living Father hath sent me, I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, what do you mean eateth? Take the Roman Catholic mass of, the, uh, of some uh, uh, wafers and some Morgan even wine? No, 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 no. That's a lie. That's a figure of speech means to partake of. As the living Father have sent me, I live by the Father. So he that partake of me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat the manna and are dead. For he that eateth this bread, Jesus speaking of himself, or partake of this bread, speaking of Jesus, shall live forever. What about that bread? What about that bread that they ate in the wilderness? What about that bread that they ate in the wilderness? That manna. That manna that they ate in the wilderness. Oh, I spit that wrong. 
that manna that they ate in the wilderness and when they was in the desert and God tried them in that desert and killed many of them off, especially the ones that was 20 years upward because of their uh, murmuring and their complaining and their disbelief. But they ate manna that God rained down from heaven and this word manna comes from the word man. Man. The word man, it means whatness. What do you mean, whatness? Well, when they seen this fresh bread raining down from the sky, as God was feeding them on a daily basis, God made provision for them, and he rained down this bread from the sky to land down upon the face of the earth. And the people have never seen such thing done in their life. And when they seen this bread fall, they said this is manna or this is whatness. Or they were saying, what is this? They knew not what it was, this miracle that God was doing. But Jesus said that, the, that their fathers ate of the whatness or the manna that fell from the sky. But Jesus said those that eat of or partake of this bread, speaking of himself, shall never die. Meaning that they will have, meaning that they will have eternal life. Not temporary life. Not if a man or woman sin 30 times, they lose their uh, eternal life. And then if they sin 50 times, their eternal life. It's changed to temporary life because they sin just a little too much. No, God has predestinated him a family, according to Romans 8, 29 and 30, that are going to be conformed a shape in the likeness or the similitude of the Son, Jesus Christ. And because he has predestinated them, they will not live their life uh, in a pattern of iniquity and a lifestyle full of darkness. No, since the light of the light of the light of this world, which is Christ, has been birthed in them by the Father. They will now portray the second nature that's been placed in them, which is the second birth, which is what Jesus stated about being born again. The word again comes from the word added, and it means from above. The birth that we see from above is the second nature. It's the spiritual nature. It's God nature being placed in us. So now we have two natures now. The first temporal carnal nature that still exists, but God kills it off slowly, but it's never all the way dead unto death. That's why you struggle and wrestle with it, and that's why sin comes along even in believers' life and as they travel along this way. But they don't live in a pattern of a lifestyle of sin habitually, ongoingly. God got a scourge, and he chastens those that he loved, and he, and he chastens everyone that he loves, and he scourges those who, who he has received as sons or daughters. So when you partake of the true living bread, you never die. Your eternal life does not change the temporary life because you get into iniquity. Now, the believer grows to hate iniquity because the inner man, which is Christ in us, according to Colossians 1.27, Christ in us, the hope of glory, hates sin. So his light began to cast down our darkness. He has brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that we have been, how have we, are we that who, how, how are we who are dead to sin, how can we continue any longer than we in, meaning living in in a pattern of lifestyle of darkness, sin, iniquity, and corruption. Amen. Look at verse 60 of John 6. It says, Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Who can obey it? Who can listen to these sayings? Verse 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his ding ding disciples which is the word matthetes a literal learner 
One that follows, follows intimate, intimately in a teaching. It says, many the, uh, verse 61, when Jesus knew himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? See, many hard sayings of the scripture will offend you. Because some of the scripture offend me at times when it catches me in the wrong or it catches me in my ignorance. Does this offend you? Verse 62, what and if ye shall see the Son of Man a sin up where he was before? In the spirit, it is the spirit that quickeneth or makes alive. The flesh profited nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. Holy. He was speaking to his disciples. But then he told them there are some of you who believe not. So he had disciples walk with, walking with him. Not just the twelve. But he had many disciples walking with him, or many learners walking with him. But not all of the learners were uh, intimately following Christ. Many of them following, followed him for the body loads and the fishes, just to see the miracles. Not many of them were following along for the true matter, the spiritual matter that proceeded from the mouth of God, from the mouth of the Savior. The word that he speak, meaning Jesus, they, those words are spirit and their life. They are the true manna. And those that eat of that manna or that bread shall never die. Verse 64, but there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and also who was going to betray him. Verse 65, and he said, therefore I say unto you, that no man can come unto me. Jesus said, no man can even come to me. Forget a man's will and what he desires to, because you talk about free will. The word will means desire, determination, or choice. Even though you have a desire, determination, and choice that comes from your mind, and God controlled that too, according to Proverbs chapter 16, verse 1. Even though a man has determination and choice and thoughts and plans in his mind. Jesus said that no man can even come unto him. Except it were given to him of his father. The word given. It means to be granted as a favor by definition. So let me read it like that. Verse 65. And he said, Therefore I say unto you, that no man can come unto me except, or unless it were granted as a favor by my Father. Not unless he go by his free will, unless he just determined to do it because he want to. You're dead in your sins. How can you determine to do something when you're dead in your sin? You have to be brought alive first. And you can't bring yourself alive from the dead by a uh, uh, by your free will because your free will is non-existent you are dead when you start off you're dead spiritually from the jump start it is God that quickeneth whom he wills John 5 21 it is the son that quickeneth who he will John 5 21 so the son bring alive or put spiritual life in a person of whom he wills they go to the word will again. It's of the Father's will. Not man's free will. Therefore I say unto you that no man can come unto me except or unless it were granted as a favor unto him by my Father. If God does not grant a man a favor to, to uh, wake up from the dead by the, uh, by the preaching of the gospel, by God's will, by God's determination, by God's choice, a man don't come alive. And a man then can't come to the son because it has not been granted as a favor to him by the father. Now look at verse 66. 
from that time after Jesus said that, that no man can come unto me except to be granted as a favor by my father. From that time, many of his what? Ding, ding, ding. Disciples. Many of his learners, his literal learners, went back. They left him. They forsook the Lord. And they walked with him no more. Anybody can be a disciple, which means they can start learning about the Lord, learning the, of Jesus and the things that pertain to Jesus and Jesus' doctrine. But if God don't cause it to take root, and Jesus is the root out of dry ground, if God does not take the cause the word of God to take root in a person's heart, if Christ does not birth himself in a person's heart, which comes from the word cardia, which means the mind, then a person is not a disciple indeed, or a disciple in truth. So then, in verse 67, then Jesus said unto the twelve, the twelve that he chose, the disciples that turned and went away and walked with him no more were not chosen. They were not disciples indeed. Verse 67, then Jesus said unto the twelve, will ye also go away? Verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou has the words of eternal life. You know what Peter was saying to him? Where are we going to go? You have the true food. The type of food that gives us true life. It's a cost of being a disciple. You have to give up you to follow or be in the same way with Christ. Salvation is free. But you have to pay a cost to be the learner of the Lord. You have to pay a cost and give up some things, yea, even made much of your own life, your own self, to follow Christ. And not everybody's going to do that, but the disciples indeed will. And not everybody, I say it again, is a disciple. And not every disciple is a true believer. But every true believer is a disciple indeed. Nobody want to pay the cost. Not many people want to pay the cost. I look at myself. God has caused me to pay the cost in many different areas of my life when it comes to the gospel. And for the gospel's sake. When I look at my life and then I look at the life of the believers around the globe that's being killed, martyred, raped, brutally burned, beheaded, dismembered, chased for their life, homeless as they run for their life. I look at them myself and I said, I ain't paid a cost yet. I ain't came to the point of shedding blood yet. When the believers around the world are standing firm unto death, they see seeing death daily. Here I am in Babylon, and sometimes my flesh get laxed over here. And I look at myself and say, I'm not paying a cost. The true believers that's under that persecution paying a real cost. The believers in America better prepare themselves. You fake non-disciples indeed. You're not paying a cost. You're not even better cross now. Living this wicked, ungodly nation of America. There's a cost to being a disciple. Let's move forward. If you continue my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Now there's not two levels of Christianity or two levels of being a believer or a Christian. There's not two levels. A believer is a disciple. It's not that a person, God saves a person, so a person can, uh, a person uh, believes on the, on the gospel of the Lord as being preached in his rareness and in his truthfulness, and then they, they, they believe on it just to get this temporary uh, uh, um, forgiveness. And 
and um and get this this quick fix of uh of joy and peace and then they have no cross No, a disciple indeed, they believe on the Lord God because God grants it as a favor to believe on Him by the gospel of His Son, Jesus. They do get this forgiveness with a blessing. They do get this inward joy with a blessing. They do get this inward peace with a blessing. Great peace have they that love thy law, said the psalmist David, Psalms 119. But not only do they get this because God called them to believe and he's ordained them to eternal life, but they back it up by bearing a cross. Go to Luke 9. Luke 9. They back it up by bearing a cross. Well, you say many of the Americans, all they do, it's amazing. Because many of the Americans, they put a pagan cross, because the cross is a pagan symbol. It was used by the Romans, used by the Assyrians, used by even some of the Greeks. It's not a holy thing. Jesus died on a pagan symbol. But except the tree that he died on was not a crisscross, it was just a pole. There was a cross back in the day, a, a, a straight vertical pole. But the uh, uh, derivative of that straight vertical pole is the cross that you see today, which is numbered the cross or the sign or a pagan god by the name of Tammuz. America's packed with idolatry, packed with paganism, and we love it. Many of y'all love that uh, false um, fall of July just passed, right? America's a lie about everything. America's built on lie. Lie, 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 America. The independent, the, uh, the Declaration is of Independence was not officially signed on July the 4th. It was officially signed on July the 2nd. America lies about everything. And why are you celebrating the independence of a nation that still, by in every facet, are enemies and their actions are animosity and hostility and, and, and corruption towards God? What's to celebrate? You can celebrate that you're independent from this ungodly nation and dependent upon the holy and righteous God. Celebrate that. But you celebrate that every day, 365, 24-7, seven days a week. Luke, Luke 9. Luke 9. Luke 9, 23. Hallelujah. Look what Jesus said. After Jesus had said he must suffer many things and be rejected of elders and chief priests and scribes and he must be slain and then raised up again on the third day, Jesus declared in the 23rd verse of Luke the ninth chapter and he said unto them all, if any man will come, not by free will, will come in the aspect and from the standpoint that the Father has granted them a favor and brought them alive from the deadness of their sin. Not by free will. If any man will come after me, let him. That word let is not, okay, let him come, let him choose. Okay, hold on, wait till you make a choice. The word let is an imperative mode. Everybody knows that an imperative mode is a command. So Jesus is saying, if any man come after me, the one that God has granted as a favor, let him deny, the word deny comes from the word anelma, and it means to contradict. Let him contradict his own self. Deny self. Contradict self. There's a cost of being a disciple, an intimate learner, a, f learner, a follower of Christ. Let him deny, contradict himself. Take up his, what? Cross. And follow me. Or be in the same way, the narrow way with the Lord. Where you'll see the fruit trapped in that road that leads to that eternal life. So, Jesus said, let 
him, commanded that person to deny himself daily, take up his cross, and follow and be in the same way, way with him. All of that is a command, a demand from the Lord. Not a choice for you. A demand, a command from the living God himself. Now what is a cross? I was in a barber shop one day and I heard a man tell me, uh, he said to one of the brothers of mine and he said, yeah, everybody got their own cross. Some got the cross of drugs. And some got the cross of alcohol. And some got the cross of, uh, uh, of, of uh, you know, going through without having money and stuff. That's not a cross. That is a trial that that individual, whoever they, those individuals are, that's a trial that they are going through or went through. But that's not a cross. A cross proceeds and comes upon a person and in a person's life and they bear a cross when they tell the truth that the world hates. That Christmas is utter paganism. Christmas is not Christianity. A lot of the believers that came from the European nations lost their lives trying to flee to the Western world to get away from the uh, 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 paganism of Rome and the ancient Bel and the Grove worship of Israel uh, of the pagan nations even in the ancient world that Israel followed after. Bel, which means Lord, and the Grove, which means tree. They were serving the sun and tree worship, Bel and Grove worship. That's what Israel got involved in. Read Judges, the second chapter. Read Judges, the third chapter. God would overthrow Israel on, on and off, on and off. Whoop their butt, uh, 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 nurture them back. Whoop their tail, nurture them back. Because they kept going out to bell and the grove worship, which we today call uh, Christ, uh, uh, Christmas, which is nothing but the mass of Christ, Roman Catholicism. First, Bell and the Grove worship, and as time moved along, the Roman church adopted a Bell and the Grove worship of the ancient world, the same thing God killed Israel for on many occasions, and they adopted it and called it the mass. And we today call it Christ Mass or Christmas. Do a study on Christmas. It's paganism. It's ungodly. You bear a cross when you begin to tell people that God said you got to deny yourself. Not look for self-esteem or go to self-esteem conferences because he told you to deny self. How are you going to go to get self-esteem? The word self-esteem by, uh, by definition means pride and conceit. What do you mean? Go, to, uh, go and get yourself conceited and lifted up in pride when God said in Proverbs 6 that he hates even the pride of a man and a proud look. See how America's twisted? Not only that, you, you bear cross when you tell even your own wife, your own husband, your own daughter, your own son, your own grandma, your own grandpa, your own uncle, your own cousin, that your own boss, your own teacher, your own next door neighbor, that God is the sovereign God, he's shown himself a family, God kills and God makes alive, and God will deceive a person, God will make a person sick, and everything I just said is plumb scripture. Plumb scripture. And there's no such thing as free will, and that birthdays, when you read about the two, the two or three counts of birthday celebration in the Bible, it was all done amongst the heathenistic pagan societies and cultures, and their birthdays are exalted, exaltation of self. And Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes that better is the day of one's death than the day of one's birth. How are you going to glorify the day of your birth when you realize, when you... When you should be realizing that you sin against God with this natural first birth. It's only the new birth that gives you a right standing with God. But that first birth, you want to celebrate it. And it's that first birth that always caused you to go contrary and sin against the holy God. How are you going to glorify this first birth, this flesh? How is it going to be done? So you bear a cross by telling the truth. Not about getting strung out on dope and stuff. That's the cravings of your flesh that got you into that. Just like the craze of my flesh got me into sleep with, with so many women. Committing adultery. So many acts of fornication. Stealing robbing. Stealing cars. Kicking in doors. Selling dope. Selling cocaine. Selling crack. Selling marijuana. It was the cravings of my flesh that got me in that. Just like the cravings of your flesh get you in things. Just like the cravings of a believer's flesh get us caught up in sin, even as a believer at times. 
Thank God He shames us and causes us to repent. So everybody's not a disciple indeed. And everybody does not bear a cross. The only ones that bear a cross for Christ are the disciples indeed or the disciples in truth. There's a cost to being a disciple. You got to give up some things. Look at the next verse. After he, read, after he said uh, in verse 23 that they must bear the cross daily and follow and be in the same way with him. Look at verse 24. There's a cost to being a disciple. And as I said before, the number one thing you'll have to give up and pay the cost. Uh, the number one way you're going to have to pay a cost is give up yourself. Look at verse 24. For whosoever shall find his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, Jesus said, that's when you find your life. When you want to attain a, your, uh, establish yourself and attain some uh, 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 permanent life in this temporal life, this temporal world, you want to make yourself an authority in the name of this temporal world? You're looking to establish yourself uh, uh, forever upon this earth and make yourself a name upon this wicked, corrupt earth? You lose your life. But when you deny yourself and contradict yourself and bear your cross daily, seeking to please God, and you do it for Jesus' sake or Yahshua's sake, that's when you find true life. That's when you find true life. Not only that, so they make up two, uh, they, get, they basically get two levels. So this person that believes on the Lord God by God ordained it to be so, supposedly, that's what the people say. I know God ordained people to eternal life. But I'm speaking from the aspect of thinking from the mindset of some of these false teaching uh, 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 individuals, even pastors and other individuals. So a person believes they get this precious forgiveness, this precious inward joy, and this precious inward peace. But they don't go out and bear a cross. They're not being disciples indeed. So people say a person can be saved. But that don't mean they have to be a disciple. In other words, this is the first stage. But being a disciple is the second stage. That's a lot. No, you don't have to work to be saved. But you work because you are saved. In other words, you don't pay to get salvation. But because you got salvation that, and God granted, to, get granted it to you as a favor, there's a cost you have to pay for being those that he has so graciously chose to be an inheritance of his salvation. Amen. Amen. And so therefore... When a person is really born again of God and Christ has been birthed in them, they have been born again from above by God and by God only. Not, that, not by the hand of a mortal man, but by an infinite God. They not only get this, but they also, with this, have a cross that they bear. The truth that they speak. They are a witness and a martyrdom for Christ. They are examples of him on the earth. They bear fruit as Jesus required in John 15. He, Jesus said in John 15 that his disciples, verse 8, I read that, John 15. Look at verse 8. Jesus said, Herein is my Father glorified. Herein is my Father glorified. How's the Father glorified, Jesus? That ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciple. Not just experience of, of forgiveness of your sins. Not just experience of inward joy. Not just experience of inward peace. But you also bear cross and also you bear fruit. Luke 9 to the 3 said that they take up and bear a cross daily. And Jesus said in John 15 that they bear much fruit so proven to be his disciples. Ding, ding, ding. Disciples. You have disciples who learn and know about Jesus and know about doctrine, even learn of his doctrine. But you have also disciples indeed, and those are the ones that are Jesus' true or Yahshua's, 
Yahshua's true disciples, true learners, intimate followers. As a matter of fact, a disciple is a person that follows one's teachings, also a person who follows or upholds a leader. Who's our leader? Christ. So you uphold your leader. How do you uphold him? You uphold the words that he spoke. You uphold the standard of life that he requires and demands. A mathetase is a supporter of a cause and a supporter of a leader. That's Christ. A mathetase is one who sticks a whole fast to a teaching. Oh, that's true. A master taste is also one who is connected and associated, especially by contract. Oh, associated and connected, especially by contract? Huh? Of course so. Because we are under contract. That's what a covenant means. A covenant means a covenant means agreement. It means a contract. It means a will. And it means a, a testament. We uphold the contract or the agreement. Or the new will that God, that Jesus brought forth, or the new testament. Because we are his disciples indeed, we uphold our leader's contract that we have between he and we. That's what we do. So if the true disciples hold fast. And he stick to the teachings. Just like the twelve did when the other disciples forsook him, went away, and walked with the Lord no more in John 6. He turned to the twelve and they uphold, they upheld, and they stuck with his teachings. They pay the cost. Many of them pay the cost with their life. It's going to come a time very soon in America where we're going to pay a cost as far as jail time for the standard of the gospel. Serious persecution, which means literal hands I'm talking about upon us and some of us death. It's going to get that vicious in America. Because this whorish nation, this Babylonian nation, this um, doubly dead nation, this nation that is a well without spiritual water, this hypocritical nation, as God called it in the book of Jeremiah, we're going to have to drink the cup. We are going to have to undergo the baptism, many of us, the same baptism that Jesus underwent, which was death for the sake of his father. The drink of a cup means to undergo a death. To undergo a baptism didn't mean to get dipped in some H2O. The word baptism had a few different terms, but one of them is not getting dipped in water. We're going to have to undergo a true baptism. Undergo a death one day, some of us. But you know what? We should be going to, uh, the truly believers, the disciples indeed, should be undergoing a death on a daily basis. Every day. That's on a daily, day-to-day -day basis. Which means we die daily to ourselves and not have self-esteem. Then are we here disciples indeed. So, we uphold his contract, we uphold his agreement, we uphold his will and testament. That's what we do. Disciples pay a cost. And so, there's not two different levels. There's not a believer who, can just, who believes and saved because he simply believed and then... Uh, if they, do, if they grow enough or bear enough fruit, then they can be called disciples. No, God's believers, they do get the forgiveness, they do get the joy, and they do get the peace, but they also bear cross. He's ordained, ordained us to that. That's what sets us apart. Jesus' words cause us to have a cross and be hated by the world. 
Jesus said in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. So don't mock the word hate you because you're standing for Christ. It's a cost to be a true, true disciple or disciple indeed. Go over to Luke 14. Luke 14. Luke 14. Luke 14. We're going to pick up in verse number. That's a cost of, that's a cost of being a disciple. There is a cost. Look at verse 25. You need to love Jesus more than your own self. Not self-esteem. Love him more than your own self and die to self-esteem. Or die to pride, which means you also die to conceit. It's one and the same. Don't be conceited. Look at verse 25 of Luke 14. And when, and there went great multitudes with him. So they was going with Jesus. And he turned and said unto them, What did he say to them? Now many of you are not going to like these words, but I live by them. Think it's by my strength? You're alive, you think so. I'm a weak, I'm, I, I, I call myself corrupt. Yeah, I live by the laws of God and I love the laws of God. And many people bear witness, but as much as I read as holy as God is, I call myself corrupt. I can't, when I put myself up against God, I'm not automatically, even a corrupt. How many preachers going to say that? Oh, but I love holiness. I love purity. I love death to self. I love when I find myself in the wrong so I can be corrected. Look at verse 25. So Jesus turned to them and said unto them, verse 26, If any man come to me, the ones that God has granted the favor to do so, not by a free will, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and sisters and brothers, and he go the most important one. And yea, even his own life. Why are you trying to build a self esteem? Even his own life, if they don't do this, cannot be my master. You can't even learn of Christ, you can't be an intimate follower of his. You can't uphold this testament, uphold this new testament. You can't uphold the contract. You can't be a supporter of the of, of, a, of your leader, Christ, if you're not practicing daily death to your wicked self. You can't bear, you can't be a disciple indeed if you're not bearing a cross. And you cannot be a disciple indeed if you don't have a righteous hatred towards your sister, mother, brother, children, wife, husband, and even your own life also. You can't learn of the Lord our God. There is a cost of being a disciple. Salvation has been free and God freely give that salvation. But those that have freely obtained their salvation have a cost to pay for being ones that have been granted a favor to have it. There's a cost of being a disciple. I know there's a cost. You think you don't have weaknesses in the flesh in your body? To the believers of God, some of us get caught up in ruts sometime along the way. We got a heart that love God and a mind that want to serve the Lord because he gives us that mind. But times along the way we get caught in ruts because of the cravings of this evil, mortal, corrupt nature. What is my advice? What is my proverb to you? What is the proverb to me? Do what you can as quick as you can to get out of that iniquity. No matter what it takes, no matter what it costs, Plead for God's mercy and strength to get out of that weakness that you're caught in. Don't tell me God not merciful. Look at 
Now, so you have to even hate on your own life. So what does this hating your mother, father, sister, brother, children, wife, brother, and even your own life mean? It's not a natural physical hatred. I mean, you hate because oh, she thinks she's walking like this, she thinks she look like that, he thinks he got this, he thinks he this, he thinks he that. That's a foolish, carnal, worldly, stupid, earthly hatred. I'm talking about the type of hatred that's righteous and pure that God puts in his people to basically forsake all to follow him. Jesus will make you give up things to follow him. Just because people give up things don't mean they're going to they're saved and they love God. But God will make some even his true elect give up things and put them to the test. To prove and try them to see so they could see where their love really lies. How do I know that? Go over here. Before I go there, Jesus ended when he said, if you don't even hate even your own life also, you cannot be his intimate learner or his disciple indeed, or which means his disciple in truth. Then he also said in verse 27 of Luke 14, verse 27, and whosoever do not bear his cross with the meaning the truth that comes out of your mouth, the truth of our Lord. If you do not bear it and take it up daily and stand on it daily, you cannot be his intimate learner or his disciple in truth. So the forgiveness and the peace and the joy does come when you believe on the Lord God. Those who those who is who he calls to believe, it comes. But it doesn't come without the cross. It doesn't come without separation from yourself and even this ungodly world. You're in this world, but you need not look like you're off this wicked world. Peter said, we're nothing but soldiers while we're here on this earth. Now, go over here to Matthew 10. Matthew 10. Matthew 10. There's a close, truly a cost of being a disciple of God. Matthew 10. Matthew 10. <coughs> was it Mark 10? Let me see. Matthew... There's a cost. Look at verse 32 of Matthew 10. Verse 32, as a cost to pay, 